This is a community-supported legal education channel. Find out how you can support our mission at the links in the description below. But first, what I wanted to speak to you about is something very important that I see a lot of misconceptions about, and that is the basic court rules of evidence and particularity when it comes to fraud. Here is Federal Rule of Civil Procedure Rule 9, Pleading Special Matters. Now this comes directly after Federal Rule of Civil Procedure Rule 8, which is the general rules of pleading. A pleading that states a claim for relief must contain a short, plain statement of jurisdiction, a short, plain statement of the claim, and a demand for the relief sought. So you don't get into federal court without those basic things simplified. But then there's Rule 9, Pleading Special Matters. Now I see a lot of misconceptions recently floating around Twitter about the various court cases that a certain president of the United States is bringing in various court jurisdictions. So disclaimer, this is going to be an oversimplification. So of course, in no way was this ever really legal advice because none of it's individualized. There's a whole bunch of different court cases, but in particular, this summary is going to be oversimplified because I'm going to give you one taste of the law or one perspective. And instead, what we really have is different states, Michigan and Georgia and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, they all have their own state court rules, but they're all going to follow some similar procedures and some similar policies. So what we have here is pleading special matters and, and so what we're looking for here are, well, what special matter? Are we talking about capacity to sue? Not really. Are we talking about conditions precedent or judgment? No, no, no. We're talking about this one, fraud or mistake. So in alleging fraud, because that's what we're talking about in these president, presidential lawsuits, in the election, we're talking about the elections clause, the electors clause, the equal protection clause. And so when someone says there was fraud in the election process, what is it that they need to do? This is not going to be a video about the politics of whether it's right or wrong, but rather I wanted to go over the standard so you can have some knowledge to back up your evaluation for yourself. I want you to be able to evaluate for yourself. When you see someone say, there has been fraud, you can say, okay, now I know what fraud means to the courts. And I can say whether the claim of fraud is backed up by evidence or not. So when someone alleges fraud in court, they must state with particularity the circumstances constituting fraud. With particularity means they must connect all the dots. When did the fraud occur? How did it occur? What evidence is there? Whereas in Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 8, we just need a statement of the facts. This needs to be pled with particularity. So I've seen certain people quote my cousin Vinny, and that's actually great. My cousin Vinny was a great example of how close to trouble, actually getting themselves rather into big trouble, Joe Pesci got himself into in My Cousin Vinny. What happened in My Cousin Vinny was you had an out-of-state lawyer. He was from New York, and I think he was in Ala F in Bama, right? Uh, you killed a good old boy. Uh, there is no way the case is not going to trial, right? Some of that's actually correct. These were practical considerations of how the court system was going to work. But if you remember, there was a section where Vinny met with the judge and the judge gave him this big book of rules. And that's where Vinny started the lie about having studied uh, and having having practiced for a long time under the name, what was it, Jerry Gallo or something like that? 
And the reason for all of that was because he was an out-of-state lawyer coming into Alabama court and wanted to be able to appear pro hoc vice, wanted to be able to appear for this case to defend his cousin, right? Uh, cousin, you know, Vinny. And then, of course, cousin was was the, the, the one of the men who were accused of the murder. There were lots of things there that are funny and accurate, but not so educational. For example, the standards of evidence. In My Cousin Vinny, there was several scenes where evidence was presented at the very last minute. And there was some voir dire, voir dire of Marissa Tomei at the end there and whether she was an expert witness. And there was a very dramatic scene about whether she actually worked in a mechanic shop as a mechanic. And it turned out that she did. And she presented some expert testimony. Well, that was all very dramatic. But that part, while it could happen that way, wasn't really that accurate in the sense that most of the time we would never present evidence that way. Most of the time evidence is not a surprise because when you have a civil case, you have some standards. At the beginning of a civil case, you have a Rule 16 conference. Now, I just said Rule 16, but I brought up Rule 26. A Rule 16 conference is something the judge will hold to get the beginning things out of the way, like scheduling, what are the issues, are we going to need expert witnesses, are we going to have a jury trial? And when you have the Rule 16 conference, you have to also be following this Rule 26, which is the beginning of your evidentiary rules. Rule 26 is your duty to disclose certain things. At the very, very beginning of the case, before you ever get to discovery, like right before, it's the beginning of it, before you get to trial, before you get to have that My Cousin Vinny moment where you wow the jury and convince the entire courtroom that your case is, is holding water, as they say in My Cousin Vinny, you have these initial disclosures. Without awaiting a discovery request, the party must provide to the other parties the name and address and telephone number of every individual likely to have discoverable information. Reminder that discoverable information is any information that's relevant to the plaintiff's claims or the defendant's defenses. And if there's any counterclaims, then the reverse. Anything that's relevant to the claims and defenses in the case. Relevancy is anything that makes those claims or defenses more likely to be true or less likely to be true. So at the very, very beginning of the case, you must disclose who has discoverable information along with the subject of that information. This is regarding the evidence that the disclosing party may use to support its claims or defenses, unless, unless it's being used solely for impeaching a witness, for discrediting a witness. So that disclosure you don't need to make. So you're allowed to surprise an already disclosed witness that you are cross-examining on the stand. You're allowed to surprise them with evidence of impeachment, of discrediting them. But we're talking about the substantive evidence. So when you're, when you're talking about the claims and defenses in the case, you have to disclose that up front. You also have to disclose a copy or description of all documents, electronically stored information, tangible things that the disclosing party has in its possession, custody or control, and may use to support its claims or defenses also, unless the use would be solely for impeachment you have to disclose a computation of damages calculations. And in insurance cases, you have to disclose the insurance agreement. And usually in contract cases, you have to disclose the contract at some point. So that number two there is a big one. You have to disclose the documents. You have to disclose the evidence that you're going to use to support your case. So when you see a election fraud claim, you must not only plead with particularity exactly what fraud you saw up front, you must also disclose the evidence that you have in the beginning of the case. Now, Rule 26 
and Rule 16 only come into play after you have passed that pleading stage. So this is the end of the pleading stage, the beginning of the discovery stage. The pleading stage is where a defendant might file a motion to dismiss, or a counterclaim defendant might file a motion to dismiss. So it's possible to get there, to get to a dismissal of the case without having to disclose the evidence. So you don't have to disclose the evidence when you file the complaint, but you do have to disclose fraud when you file the complaint. So if they're making, if someone, anyone, is making a claim of election fraud, they've got to tell you how that fraud occurred from beginning to end in the beginning. And then when you get into the meat of the case, they've got to disclose the evidence. So when you see that there are claims that these cases of fraud are somehow, the, the lawyers are going to wait to present their evidence at the final moment, the My Cousin Vinny moment in the middle of the trial, the trial that's at the very end of the case. You've actually gone through six or seven or eight steps already, several of which require you to have disclosed that evidence up front. There is certainly a situation where maybe there could be evidence that is later discovered. I don't mean discovery in the legal sense, but someone finds some evidence at the end of a case and then the parties will have to have a meeting with the judge of how that evidence is supposed to be handled and instead of it being a surprise evidence or a surprise witness usually the judge will give the parties time to then exchange that evidence go over that evidence privately investigate that evidence come up with their arguments because the judge and the legal system want the case to be tried on its merits not someone winning because one party had the element of surprise there is no element of surprise except like i said in impeaching a witness what do i mean by impeaching a witness that's always kind of a tough one to just imagine you know you Impeachment is something we talked about with the president earlier this year. It's not quite the same thing. Impeaching a witness means discrediting a witness. You'll know what I mean when you see it now, but impeaching a witness means when a witness gets up and says, I was there, I saw the thing, and he did A, B, C, and D. And then the guy comes up and he says, you know, okay, could you please tell me what this document is? Oh, these are my plane tickets. Okay, what's the date on the plane ticket? Oh, it's the same date that uh, that, that the event happened. Uh, okay, here here's a picture of your, here's a, you know, copy of your Facebook profile. What are these? Oh, these are pictures of me on a beach in Hawaii when the event happened in, in, in you know, on in, in, on in Michigan or something. Uh, okay, so you couldn't have been there. You you know you 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 couldn't have witnessed this with your own eyes. That's impeachment. You're discrediting the witness. That evidence does not need to be presented in a Rule 26 disclosure. That evidence might not need to be presented in a discovery situation. Discovery is where a party will request documents and things or admissions or written statements or have testimony under oath in the middle of the pre-trial process, in the middle of litigation, before we get to a trial, before we get to a jury, before we get to a judgment or summary judgment, which would be without a jury. The discovery process could still uncover those things if someone a party had reason to know that the other party had those things and requested them formally in discovery. Uh, discovery requests are usually, please produce all documents you have regarding the claims and defenses in this case. A little bit generic, but you'll see discovery requests like that. Uh, please uh, present, please, please turn over all uh, communications that your client had with the opposing party or with their board of directors or with the customer that's suing them or something like that. And so there will be a formal request and then a formal response. The formal response might be objections. This is irrelevant or, or some other argument. Um, the objections might be overcome by a motion to compel. The parties literally have a fight over the evidence in the middle of the pretrial process. You do not get to a trial 
having all parties competently represented with surprise evidence that was relevant to the claims and defenses at issue. So when you see someone making a claim of election fraud, and then a judge dismisses the case for lack of evidence, first off, they're dismissing the case at the beginning, in a, in, during a motion to dismiss, or after some basic evidentiary hearing for a injunction of some kind. A lot of these are for injunction, injunctive relief. Instead of asking for money, you're asking the court to do something like invalidate votes or force a recount or allow observers to stand closer. And I'm not getting into the substance of all that. That will be a topic for a later video because some of it was really interesting. But when you see it with your own eyes, you see a tweet go out or you see a news article written and it says that there was election fraud now you know, in order to plead that in court, it has to be pled with particularity. The evidence has to be turned over. There are no surprise documents. If they have the evidence, it must be presented up front. If they don't have the evidence, they're not going to survive a proper motion to dismiss. I can I can imagine a my cunny my cunny. I can imagine a my cousin Vinny situation where something is improperly handled and a case is able to proceed without proper disclosure of evidence or proper discovery responses, or there's even a situation where sometimes improper discovery responses could lead to admissions of either guilt or liability when you didn't mean to do that because you didn't properly respond to discovery. But we're assuming that things are being properly handled by competent attorneys you're never going to encounter a situation where there is surprise evidence, where someone is sitting on evidence of voter fraud and just waiting to present it at the last minute. A judge and the legal process would not allow that, again, assuming everything's handled properly. And for it to be handled improperly would be a matter that would open the situation up for appeal. And appeal is going to be limited to issues that were raised in the lower court. The appeals court is not going to hear new evidence and is not going to hear new arguments. No appeals court is going to be a second or third bite at the apple or an opportunity to retry the whole case. An appeal is simply going to be where a party identified something wrong with the underlying court's decision based on the record before that court, and the appeals court is going to decide whether that very specific issue was handled properly, and they're going to decide factual issues based on the evidence that was presented in the lower court. There is no opportunity to present new evidence in an appeal situation. So an appeal is going to be like if a party disagrees with the dismissal of the case, they're going to make their argument why the case shouldn't have been dismissed, and then the appeals court says yes or no and sends it back to the lower court for further adjudication if there was something wrong and otherwise upholds the lower court's decision if the appeals court agrees with the lower court. Again, the appeals decision is not an opportunity to present new evidence or retry the case. So I'm not imagining that these situations will be open for appeal, but you don't want that. When you're an attorney representing a party, you don't want to make mistakes or allow mistakes that will then later allow your win to be overturned on appeal. You want to close all that up. You want to sew all that up. You want to button that all together before you get there. So there really isn't a situation where you're going to be finding yourself receiving surprise evidence at the very end of a fraud case. It is certainly possible, like I said, if there really is a sudden uncovering of evidence that, that previously no one had realized that was available. Maybe somebody does learn something new, but then that something new gets presented to the judge and the judge decides how much time the parties have to go over that. If it happened in the middle of trial, the judge would consider adjourning the trial, allowing the parties to evaluate the evidence and then presenting their case in another 
date of for the trial same jury same situation same case but the judge would just stop the trial would would allow the parties to evaluate the evidence and then allow the thing to uh to continue later on what happened in my cousin Vinny would be an anomaly and that's what made my cousin Vinny great as a movie is because all of the different anomalies. Vinny was not an experienced attorney. He was out of state dealing with another court's rules. He didn't understand procedure, which is something separate from the substantive law of yes or no was a murder committed. Here's the procedure of how the court does its business. And you have to follow all of that. And it's complicated. You'll have here the federal rules of civil procedure. You'll have the court's local rules, the court system's local rules. You'll have the actual courtrooms, the, the, the judges' local rules. And you might even have uh, a couple other basic rules of formatting or basic rules of admission. There's probably five or six different sets of rules that an attorney has to follow. So I just wanted you to know that when you see these claims, it's not that there couldn't be a proof of these claims. I'm not speaking to whether these claims can be proven or not. You're just not going to see them proven at the last minute in a surprise situation. They need to be played with particularity up front. Evidence needs to be disclosed. Evidence needs to be discovered. And only after all of that is properly completed will the case actually go to a trial. And there will be no surprises other than maybe impeaching witnesses. Let me know what you think in the comments below. So that's our show. Thanks for joining me. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. This is Lawful Masses, your favorite legal news and education program here on YouTube, on Twitch, and on Floatplane. We are community supported by our patreon.com slash ljfrench supporters, by our sponsors.com slash law supporters, by our YouTube members and our Floatplane subscribers. Thank you very much in the month of November to our $50 plus supporters, Joe Tyson, Wes Delge, Citizen of the Sovereign, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Evie, Kyle Mudrock, Spirit Bear, Andy, Benjamin Hightoff, Goliath Cleric, Ugly Grill, Shiloh T, Rudolph Besherer Jr., Oscar the Prophet, Jay Dixon, Hot Grills in Your Area, Brandon Abel, Torpedon, Cassandra Curran, Mayor of Titty City, Shadow Tycho, RDH Dragon, Earthbound Star, and No Copyright Violation Intended. The $5 plus supporters are scrolling on the LED panel behind me. All of you are crawling on the screen in front of me. I love you all. I will see you in the videos that drop. Bye.